Hey everyone, I'm here with my friend, Dr. Dara O'Carroll. He's based out of Hawaii. He's an emergency room doc. You may have come across his article that he wrote in Vice. It's a wonderful piece about the sacrifices that frontline doctors are making as this pandemic becomes a real threat to us all. So doc, thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. And it's uh, uh, great to not only talk to you, but um, uh, everybody that uh, we can spread a great message and that this is something that uh, we need to take seriously. I'm in Hawaii, in Honolulu, so we haven't quite seen a bigger wave than where you are, Chris. Um, but from where all my colleagues, I do have quite a few colleagues who are working in New York, um, it is definitely hitting at this time. And um, I'm not sure who's going to be watching this, but everybody can do their part to you know, help this, uh, this pandemic. Because what we really need to do, and it's uh, I don't want to beat the the drum too much, but this drum does need to be beat, uh, beaten, that we do need to flatten that curve. Part of the reason I'm doing these interviews is because there's people I know who still don't get it. Mm -hmm. Why should people listen to you, and why is this worse than the seasonal flu? I think people should listen to all their healthcare providers because we don't have a reason to spin this any other way than for your benefit and society as a whole's benefit. A regular flu strain, a regular hefty flu season fills our hospitals to the, our capacity. And so even a bad flu strain will do that. So this being twice as infectious as flu, it's got an R naught, which is a reproduction number or the average amount of patients that say, Chris, you were to have this disease. Um, the average amount of people that you would spread it to is about two to two and a half. And those, those numbers are fluctuating, but we think it's probably going to end up right around there. So the flus are not is only about 1.3. And so it's double as transmissible as the flu. And so to expect that this isn't going to go globally and it, to expect that this isn't going to go rip through uh, communities really is, is, is uh, uh, doing yourself and our community a, a tremendous disservice. Mm -hmm. And I really discourage people from taking this um, just off the, off your shoulder. This is something really to be, consider it as a serious threat. The high risk of this, this, this disease is that the mortality rate is not just the flu. The flu's mortality rate is 0.1% for all comers. That's the seasonal flu and not you know the pandemic 1918 strain that Chris, you're so familiar with. But 1% of people, so 10 times more people are gonna, are gonna pass away from this disease. And that's a significant, significant amount of people for one, the entire world population, but two, um, for you and your families. And I think if we all do our part to curb the transmission of this, um, it's really going to uh, help flatten that curve. People can spread this virus without even realizing it. Can you talk a little bit about that? There is two periods that I'd like people to be familiar with. There's the latent period and then there's an the incubation period. So the latent period is the time from when you contract this disease to when you become infectious to others. The incubation period is when the time starts at the same time when you contract this disease, but when you actually become symptomatic. And studies have been showing that the difference between those periods are significant on the order of days. And so the average incubation period is in five to six days. It can be all the way up to 21. That's really rare, but usually no longer than 14 days, usually no shorter than a couple of days. So um, the latent period can be one to two days or so, three days. So there's a couple of days where you're actually having no symptoms, but you could be infectious to others. So the reason for the social isolation is very, very, very important. So this thing is more contagious than seasonal flu. It's actually deadlier. And then on top of that, it's occurring while you're already dealing with a flu season. Yeah, we're still in the tail end of flu season. I'm still seeing uh, a good amount of flus every shift. And um, we still have our day-to-day -day emergencies. Um, you know, our car crashes, our uh, infections, our strokes, our heart attacks. And so on top of that, we're having to deal with this massive influx of patients. And so 
where this is really going to be harmful when the mortality rates are going to climb is when the influx of patients is greater than our medical capacity to care for them. And let's just take Hawaii as a, as a uh, microcosm. We've got 1.4 million people that live in, Hon uh, in Hawaii. Uh, let's say most estimates say that about 50 to 70 percent of our population could be, uh, could be infected with this. And let's say that curve is really steep. You know, they all get infected all at once or within the next two to three weeks. Um, that's 700,000 people. OK, uh, if you take five percent of those that are going to need critical care, that's somewhere around 40 to 35,000 people. We do not have enough critical beds, critical care beds to cope with that, nor do we have enough ventilators. A rough number of the amount of ventilators we here have here in Honolulu is about 500. So the number 500 ventilators, 45,000 potentially critically ill patients, um, that's astronomical. I mean, the math behind all of this is just staggering, and there, there's no ignoring it. I mean, you can't ignore figures like that. No, you can't. You absolutely can't. And um, but there's a certain, you know, uh, wing of people who are really just saying, you know, it's it's the flu and, um, you know, the economy's going to be fine and we're going to bounce back and it'll all be great. But you can't ignore math. Like math is a pretty concrete. Uh, uh, it's either right or wrong, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I tend to agree with you. Yeah. The threat is very, very real. So you work in an ER an environment that's super high stress. What are you seeing from your department? What are your colleagues doing to prepare for this physically, mentally, and emotionally? Right now, tensions are heating up in that. What we're trying to convey as a profession as a whole is that our hospitals and emergency departments are gonna be collecting the sickest of the sick. You know, um, There's really gonna be a, a, a congregation of this virus at the, at the intersection of the emergency department where we collect and everybody else, everybody who's sick enough goes up into the, either the ICU or the hospital wards. So coming to the ER for anything, anything that's not emergent, such as, you know, uh, a stubbed toe, um, is really akin to walking into a burning building at this point. Is there a certain point at which people should wait until they get to, to go to the hospital? I mean, people should not be swarming hospitals right now. Sure. But what's the point that a person needs to present themselves to an ER? Absolutely. Great, great question. And I'm getting this question quite a bit. Um, so um, because ERs and hospitals are going to be funneling and collecting all the sickest of the sick patients throughout wherever you live, unless you're really needing hospital care, um, do you need to actually go to the hospital? And what I mean by that is if you're feeling trouble breathing, shortness of breath, um, and any kind of lung airway symptoms that really are causing you to have air hunger is a reason to use our hospital system. So in summary, what I would say in short is that if you're ever feeling short of breath or trouble breathing, that is the time to get to, the, to, to a, a hospital. Other than that, um, I would urge people, if you're feeling flu-like symptoms, um, you probably have the flu or you have this. And I know it's kind of stressful to not know and not get tested. And I would encourage you to call your local physicians first or your local health care centers or your urgent care. Always call beforehand. That's super important information for people. What I'm seeing across the country right now is that we're running out of our personal protective equipment or our PPE. Um, so we're seeing shortages of masks and you know, it's, I've accepted at this point that uh, I'm going to get this because I'm going to be around it a lot. I'm going to have not ideal situations to protect myself. But I've done the mental calculations, which are, you know, I have a small risk of passing away, one in 500 from this. Um, but some of my colleagues who are not young and healthy have much higher risks. But just being frank, like just being utilitarian is who else is going to, if I don't, who else is going to step up, you know? And so somebody has to do it. But this sort of pandemic is why we all train to be here, you know, and it's given us a lot of rejuvenation. And so uh, we're, we all understand the risks and 
like I said, if I've done, I've done the mental calculation, but I don't know if I've done the real soul calculation, if that makes sense. Sure. But, uh, but, uh, I know I'm going to proceed anyway. So. And I think, uh, I speak for a lot of worried people that, you know, we're all very thankful that we have people like you on the front lines. I think that there's a certain segment of the population that really needs to humble themselves right now. Like, this is not a joke. This is not being overblown. This is a moment to humble yourself. Humility prevents humiliation. That's a maxim that I believe in. And I think in this scenario, humility is also going to save lives. Very well put. Very well put. The only way that this didn't ravage through the billions of people that live in China is that they locked everything down. Like, why are we expecting that this, just because China did it, that we're, we're going to be immune to it, that we don't have to do the same thing? Like, why, why is that even an issue? Why are people expecting that um, this isn't a serious problem? And uh, it's really frustrating coming from the front lines that when people are taking this so nonchalantly, that um, it's putting more people at risk and even putting myself and my colleagues, my nurses, my clerks, my radiology techs, my janitors at risk. And so I don't want to be alarmist or be blue in the face talking about it, but it's something that people really need to adhere and take seriously. And it's just be all altruistic, you know, stop thinking about yourself. Uh, not don't. <laughs> I don't know why people are buying so much toilet paper, but I, I sort of understand it. There's only a 4% rate of diarrhea and even mild diarrhea in this disease, but people seem to like toilet paper. I don't know what they're using it for, but, um, people are freaking out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, altruism. Let's think about everybody as a whole. And the way that we're going to get through this is grace, love, humility, and respect for everybody else. Please stay safe. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you again soon. Uh, thank you, Chris, you guys too. And, uh, everybody be well. Thanks.